Are the Church of the Larger Fellowship, a Unitarian Universalist congregation with no geographical boundary, working toward creating a global spiritual community rooted in profound love, which cultivates wonder, imagination, and the courage to act. Adapting to the COVID-19 pandemic has been difficult for many bricks and mortar congregations. Early on in the pandemic, we were in a unique position to assist many congregations with the transition. We hosted special episodes of The View, provided advice and counseling to religious professionals, and trained congregations for live streaming worship, all while providing robust online programming for our members. From worship to covenant groups, from classes to pastoral care, and from our monthly magazine to our letter writing ministry. We have found ways to build connection and community, even through the screen. We have been a model for ministry on the margins, providing services for isolated Unitarian Universalists, becoming a spiritual lifeline for our members in prison, and investing in innovative ministry. We know better than anyone how deep and meaningful connections can be formed even from a distance. Unitarian Universalists have faced many challenges in these times, and we continue to persevere and to fight for justice and equity for all people, especially during moments of crisis. We are proud to be a leader in this faith movement, and we invite you to get involved in our ministry. We strive to be a place where anyone from anywhere can find spiritual refuge anytime they need it. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Larger Fellowship. Paul and Silas, bound in jail, had no money to go their bail. Keep your eyes on that prize. Hold on. Paul and Silas thought they were lost. The dungeon shook and the chains came off. Keep your eyes on that prize. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Keep your eyes on that prize. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Keep your eyes on that prize. Hold on, hold on. The only chain that 
that a man can stand is that chain oh hand in hand keep your eyes on that prize and hold on, hold on. You know, the one thing we did right hey. was the day we started to fight keep your eyes on that prize and hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on that prize and hold on, hold on. Welcome, welcome to the Church of the Larger Fellowship Worthy Now Worship Service. Worthy Now is a ministry of the Church of the Larger Fellowship that serves Unitarian Universalists that are incarcerated. This is one of the most important ministries of our entire faith. We honor that you are worshiping with us today and we thank you for your support. Unitarian Universalism is a non-creedal faith. We do not dictate a mandated belief in a deity. Rather, we are connected through covenant and a commitment to justice and making the world a more equitable place. We gather to be fed spiritually and in community. We gather to remind ourselves we are here to care for each other. Welcome, friends and family. Our Chalice lighting words are from Karishma Gottfried. Love loudly. Love loudly, spirit of light, of love, of all that is good and bad and in between. Give me the courage and inspiration to love loudly, to share my joy and compassion with others, to let them know how much I appreciate them. We all give and receive love, but loving loudly is one of the greatest gifts of all. And it is so simple. All it requires is one person who is willing to say to anyone and everyone, you are loved, you are worthy of love, you deserve to be loved. Spirit of life, help me spread love throughout my communities. Help me teach others to love loudly so that it begins to circle around, so I can hear it too. I light our chalice. Blessed be.
why is there a wall? It's apparent reflection from New You World edition, spring edition 2021. And it was written by me. In the book, picture book, Myra and the Big Story, two villages sat on either side of a river, so close that they could see and occasionally hear each other. In their isolation, each crafted stories about the other that may or may not have been true. And yet, both people had come from the same place, made of the same stuff. A wise elder from one of the villages said that there will never be peace in their valley until the people in both villages find a story big enough for them all. In this book, Myra, a child who in na naive curiosity crosses the river and she makes a friend. If Myra were to look over the walls into prisons today, she might ask, is this a separate village? Why is there a wall? Why are there mostly black and brown people in the wall? She would be troubled to realize mothers were behind that wall, separated from their children. Why is this when we're all made of the same stuff? The fear of the other has fed institutional bias and contributed to a burgeoning prison industrial complex, a system that exists only to separate and to punish a system so abusive that it should not be continued and it should not be tolerated. When people or society feel harm, the instinct, the instinct seems to be isolate, separate, and punish. This permeates all of our relationships and we teach it to our children from a very young age. I am a mother who has reflected a lot about what it takes to raise a child. I grew up with lessons from Dr. Spock and spare the rod and spoil the child. And then when I attended college, I learned something called proportional response. I still have no idea what that is, but it is clearly part of a culture of punishment manifested in our current prison system. Is incarceration the best society can manage when someone, someone's mere presence makes another one feel harm? Even when that first someone has not done nothing? Part of the way I deal with these questions is, is to rely on my faith. The UU's first principle is the inherent worth and dignity of each person. The seventh principle teaches respect for our interdependent web. We are all worthy and we are one village. How can we, as people of faith, accept a world that harshly sends people to prison? We need a new message, a message that is not focused on separating, isolating, and punishing. One which is focused on healing and forgiving. May it be so, blessed be. Would you please join me in a moment of prayer, of centering for yourself. Spirit of life and love, God of many names and beyond all naming, we gather today in deep gratitude for all of the blessings of our lives, for the joys that lift us up, for births and for laughter, and for the ability to be together in community. And as we feel that gratitude in our lives, we ask that your presence be with those who are experiencing hardship and sorrow, those in our midst who are here despite great pain and grief and sickness, those that we love and that we know we are connected to, and those all across our world who we have never met, but we know, we know are experiencing loss and hardship and grief and sadness and injustice. Today, 
may your strength especially be with those Unitarian Universalists to whom we are so deeply connected, who right now are behind the walls of prisons all over the world. May they know that they are connected to us. May they feel our love radiating out from us to them. In your many holy names we pray, amen. My name is Beth Murray, and I work for the Worthy Now Prison Ministry Program at the Church of the Larger Fellowship. We'd like to let you know that the following testimonials from incarcerated Unitarian Universalists contains references to suicide and transphobia. Please take care of your hearts. From the Voices Within. Benjamin, incarcerated in Georgia, wrote in December after receiving a holiday card from the CLF. Mm -hmm. I was very close to suicide and your thoughtfulness stopped me. Thank you. This is a very lonely time of year and as a mentally ill person, the fight to prove my worth to myself is my endless battle. Thomas, incarcerated in Texas, wrote that he is a trans person in solitary confinement. He's held in solitary because it is the only place 
the prison facility can keep him safe. He's allowed outside 20 minutes every day. And what he misses most is seeing the trees, which are not visible beyond the barbed wire. A reading titled Buddy by John incarcerated in Oklahoma. She arrived early Monday morning, homeless, forlorn looking, carried by the maintenance worker who had found her. By afternoon, she had perked up and was attentive and active. In fact, she'd become comfortable enough that it seemed she liked being held, but that may have been because of the air conditioning and her lack of feathers. Still, she would nestle down in my cupped hand and go to sleep. By evening, she was exploring her new surroundings energetically, scurrying around the room, exercising all her muscles, her appetite bordered on ravenous. When darkness fell and she settled in for the night in my left shoe, the world seemed at peace. Apparently, that's the way she died, peacefully during the night. There was no indication of any problems when she nestled herself into my shoe. And I checked on her every time I awoke. Few will miss this awkward, ragged looking, not yet fledged baby starling, but I will. Buddy was loved for a day, if only by me. But that's more than some beings on this planet get. And she brought joy to several people in that short time. I suspect that her mother grieves her missing child. I know I do. But I also know that I was blessed by this little time that our lives touched. I hope she was as well. John died in November, 2020. When Michael, Asia and I were in discernment about coming to the CLF, about joining as the new lead ministry team. We talked about the different areas and aspects of the church of the larger fellowship. We talked about all the great things that the church of the larger fellowship does. We just talked about everything and we dreamed about what it could be, what it is. And we talked about the areas in which we had a special calling to ministry. And I talked about the Worthy Now prison ministry and my calling in particular to that ministry. I come from a community that knows very firsthand what the prison industrial complex means. We know what it means to not know where somebody is because they're in transit. We know what it means to not see a relative just because they uh, haven't gotten a, a notice that they needed. We know what it means to have people denied medical care because their commissary account is overdrawn. We know what it means to have people caged and locked away. So I felt this special calling to the Worthy Now prison ministry. And I loved that it was called Worthy Now. I love so much that we center our CLF prison ministry around the idea that everyone is worthy now, not later, not in two years, not in five years, but now we are all worthy of love. It doesn't mean that each of us has to love every single person. 
We may not be at that place where we can love that individual, but we know that that individual is worthy of love. They're worthy of the Spirit's love. They're worthy of God's love. They're worthy of the universe's love. When we came to the Worthy Now Prison Ministry, when I became the, the director of the Worthy Now Prison Ministry, one of the things that I wanted to change was small. I wanted to change how we talk about our Worthy Now um, folks. Prior to when I got here, we talked about our incarcerated, our incarcerated CLF members. And while it's important to, to make a distinction between our incarcerated CLF members and our free world CLF members, it was interesting to me that we didn't talk about ourselves as Unitarian Universalists, first and foremost. Yes, we are members of this beautiful church of the larger fellowship, but first and foremost, we are Unitarian Universalists. So I asked that we change the way we talk about ourselves and we start talking about ourselves as incarcerated Unitarian Universalists because I think it's so important for us to understand that though by the grace of God, that person who is incarcerated would be in the pews with us in our bricks and mortar congregations. They would be with us here on Zoom. They would be with us on Facebook. They would be with us in all the different ways that we experience Unitarian Universalism, except they are caged by the state. In pastoral care, in religious education, in governance, we are breaking open what it means to be an incarcerated Unitarian Universalist. In the future, in Worthy Now Prison Ministry, we are going to be engaging our incarcerated Unitarian Universalists and our free world UUs in what it means to examine the eighth principle. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. That is the eighth principle. And we will be talking about it both in ways that talk about Unitarian Universalism, but also our accountability to each other in our CLF community. As our community begins to explore this accountability with the recommendations of, from widening the circle and the eighth principles, I'm going to ask your, to ask yourselves, when is our more convenient season? When have we put off for tomorrow? that which must be done today. What I will also encourage you to do, what we will encourage you to do and work with you to do is to personally examine those moments when it feels helpless or confusing. When this work that asks us to be doing it now feels like maybe there would be a better time later on. Those moments of discomfort Tell us something about ourselves if we only allow our bodies and our minds to pause and examine that discomfort. Because to sit in discomfort and suppress our own immediate needs in pursuit of learning something about another's is part of our highest calling. It is part of the calling that we hear from our incarcerated UUs it is part of our theology of liberation. My colleague, the Reverend Teresa Inés Soto, says that you are here to put out the ravenous flames of the world. Enough is enough. In their words, I hear that liberation is everyone else's responsibility and it is our sacred responsibility. And in the Worthy Now Prison Ministry, I hear that our most convenient season is now. Right now. No other but now. 
We can try to avoid the discomfort of that, or we can face it head on, knowing that if we do it with each other, if we do it in community, in this time, and in solidarity with communities whose lived experiences are the keys to dismantling racism and oppression, we can find that liberation. We can find each other's worthy. Yes, and we can find it now. We also celebrate abolition. It's a grandmother of US resistance movements. Black and white abolitionists perfected the speaking tour, the rally, the boycott, and cultivated leadership for later struggles such as the suffrage and labor rights. It also created the clandestine underground movement called the Underground Railroad, which has been noted by some historians as one of history's most intricate networks of, of conspiracy. The railroad, a widely cast network of aid stations, for the specific purpose of helping enslaved people escape, helped to free between 40,000 and 100,000 people. Many conductors were Black, such as Jane Lewis, a Black woman of New Lebanon, Ohio, who was known for her heroism and regularly rowing escaping uh, enslaved folks across the Ohio River. I imagine the cold mist on the river as she rowed, steering her precious cargo through the moonlit waters. Such courage, duty, and love. For some, Unitarians or Universalists, slavery was incompatible with their belief system. An excerpt from a protest against slavery by 173 Unitarian ministers published in 1845 stated, by our political, commercial, and social relations with the South, by the long silence of Northern Christians and churches, we have given the slaveholders reasons to believe that it is only the accident of our position which presents us from engaging in this system as fully as themselves. Our silence, therefore, is upholding slavery. Our silence, therefore, is upholding slavery. And we must speak against it in order not to speak in its support. We contend for mental freedom. Shall we not denounce the system which fetters both mind and body? So how does this relate to our moment? As the principle of Sankofa tells us, history is now, right? We are a part of it, and we must use what we've learned from it to move forward in optimal well-being. First, we may draw courage and inspiration from these examples and witness the parallels of our times. Our struggle for abolition continues. The American criminal justice system holds about 2.3 million people in, 18, in over 1,800 state prisons, 110 federal prisons, about 1,700 juvenile correctional facilities, 3,100 local jails, 218 immigration detention facilities, and 80 jails held in native country, as well as in military prisons, civil commitment centers, state psychiatric hospitals, and prisons in the US territories. And the inequities are extreme. Despite making up close to 5% of the global population, the US is nearly 25% of the world's prison population. And the rate of incarceration is much higher for Black, Indigenous, and people of color than for white people, despite comparable rates of offense. Also, together with the federal government, over 4,100 corporations profit from mass incarceration in the United States. Because as one of our local leaders here in Akron says, Tamario Cooper, reminds us that the US is addicted to free labor. And the reality is that the mass incarceration system we have in this country is an extension of the slave labor system of the antebellum era. Prisoners producing everything from park benches to toilet paper, to microchips, to ghoulishly, even police and prison guard uniforms. As we navigate the ways to combat this system, we remember our ancestors like Jane Lewis, rolling over the river, rolling through the anxiety, rolling through the worry, rolling through the struggle, and rolling toward a brave space. We can draw inspiration from the ways that UU history speaks to us through this moment. The struggling for more equity is part of our tradition. We have been part of a progressive movement for longer than the lifespan of this country, and have consistently been on the forefront of social change and innovation. 
in my own church here in Akron, Ohio, the ancestors of my congregation hosted the second women's rights convention. They're at the Universalist Old Stone Church, former slave, Sojourner Truth, lecture up by the gathering with her and made to I a woman's speech. I wonder sometimes, what was the board being like before that convention was convened? What were the worried comments? What were the concerns of the congregation? Was there a vote held? Was there a sigh of satisfied relief when the motion was passed? That's a history that we in Akron are still working through. And yet that question, it remains in all of our congregations. And I think it's important for us to remember that, again, abolition is the grandmother of our movement. Abolition is the goal. The US is a settler colonial corporation designed to extract labor, land, and resources from black, indigenous, and people of color. And abolition is the central and most direct way to comment on. I believe that this moment represents a renewed focus on racial and social justice and human rights. And I, and I also sometimes see a kind of compartmentalizing of causes, especially in mainstream liberal and progressive white dominated spaces and institutions. People feel like, well, I'm doing something because on Sunday I go to my food justice ministry, Tuesday is the Black Lives Matter rally, Wednesday night is yoga, and Friday I'm making phone calls to elect a straight white male democratic candidate who rails against defund the police. We need better. And we need to understand that when we are talking about free Palestine and Black Lives Matter, we're talking about ending a whole system, not just the ones that make us comfortable. And here in the US, the slave system is still in power. Our children are calling us to an equitable future, like our hymn, The Fire of Commitment, from the dreams of useful vision, one not imagined by slavery and yet imagined by what our world can be when we all live with the idea that we have worth, we have dignity, and that our values and our actions must reflect the values and actions of all of us, not just one culture. We have a duty to provide our children and our future the tools to accomplish this. To accomplish this. And I believe that together we can. Thank you.
I'd like to introduce you to Eileen Raymond. Eileen is a free world pen pal who joined our prison ministry program in 2013. She was passionate about prison reform and wanted to be the light to someone experiencing the darkness of prison. Shortly after she joined, she was matched with John, one of our members currently living in a Texas prison. And as she began to build relationship with John, she discovered that this program, this relationship she was building, it wasn't at all what she expected. And so I'd like us to hear directly from Eileen about how that experience has transformed her, how it's changed her, and what she's learned from John and learned about herself. Let's hear from Eileen. I became interested in CLF's prison ministry almost a decade ago. Prisons have been a cottage industry where I live in Northern New York since the 1980s. As I thought about the men and women, mainly from New York City, who find themselves assigned to prisons up here, eight to nine hours from their families and often in solitary confinement, I thought how difficult it must be to be cut off from family and friends. Since my life motto has always been, just because I can't do everything doesn't mean I shouldn't do the one thing I can do, I applied to Worthy Now to become a pen pal to someone incarcerated in the United States. I was paired with John, a young black man incarcerated in Texas. When I tell friends that I have a pen pal in a Texas prison, they seem surprised and curious. Why, what do you write about? And I have to admit that I too wondered what to put in that first letter. I'm a white retired college professor living a comfortable middle-class life here in Canton with my wife. What could I possibly have in common with this young man? Like any new venture, the way to start is just to start. I told John a little bit about my interests and activities and asked him what he was interested in. I soon learned that he likes to write. After he shared a few poems with me, I decided to type them up so he could see them in print. To date, John has shared literally hundreds of poems with me. When he asked about how to find poetry contests that he could enter, I helped him prepare the entries for several significant national contests. Let me share a poem he shared with me. I have a vision. Rain pours like a falling cup, drenching the foundation of my heart, sogging me to the very core. The rays of the sun dry me up, cracking like fault lines in the earth. Scorched beyond repair, my soul is sore. Sullen and put out by my world, wishing to be the source of good deeds, longing for a way to promote global happiness. Equal rights for humankind race or creed, boy or girl, peaceful nations and unions for our seeds, letting our actions, not religions, display righteousness, living with differences by understanding, judging none, learning to love and accept all, bonding together for the common goal. Create ways for outreach and start helping, holding ourselves accountable. We will not fall. It starts by a vision this could be a global goal. One thing I have learned is that my idea that I would be helping my pen pal was way too limiting. Five years ago, my son was tragically killed. When I finally wrote John about why I had not written recently, he responded, I'm very hurt to hear about Warren. I truly understand life isn't meant to be this way. Children should bury parents in old age, not a parent burying their child. Eileen, I'm very sorry. I know the anger that comes with death and all the what ifs as you spoke of. I'm confident you will not turn over to the dark side, but even you will be weak at times. And that's okay. As human beings, we are entitled to own our emotions. I won't tell you it'll be okay and you'll move on because you won't and aren't supposed to. Never let Warren go. He belongs to your heart. You can learn to embrace him even through death. My journey with Worthy Now has expanded my awareness of our interdependence more than I can ever ex expected. 
I set out to bring light to a fellow human being and I ended up learning what true friends do for each other. As I minister to John, he ministers to me. Worthy now makes all this possible by supporting free world participants like me, but even more importantly, by facilitating the growth of our more 1000 members serving time in our country's prison system. That's why I support Worthy Now, and I invite you to join us in this ministry in whatever way you can. Generosity is a spiritual practice that all religious communities depend on to make our mission happen in the world, to make our ministries happen in our communities. We encourage your generosity to your home congregation and invite your generosity as well to the Church of the Larger Fellowship. Our prison ministry serving over 1300 incarcerated Unitarian Universalists around the United States depends on the generosity of members and friends and partners all over our world. And we thank you in advance for considering it. Thank you. As we end our time together, we carry with us the light of love and connection to each other and to Unitarian Universalists all over the world, whether they are in the free world or part of the carceral state. Deep gratitude for my colleagues and everyone who took part in bringing this special service to all of you. I want to read an excerpt from a letter written from one of our incarcerated Unitarian Universalist Church of the Larger Fellowship members. George had written an appreciation for a remembrance that was published in our monthly publication quest. George writes, quote, I have lost so much being incarcerated. My friends and family have passed or moved on over the years. My emergency contact information is blank. I often wondered who would ever miss me if I passed. This touching article answers that question for me. Your kind words and acts of remembrance are soul inspiring. I just want to say thank you for all that you do. I know that sometimes we, the incarcerated, forget to tell you that we appreciate all you do. Please keep up the good work and know that you are not forgotten. Beloveds, I will sing, extinguish our chalice, but not the light of love and justice. Go forth and carry the flame carry with you the Unitarian Universalist charge that we are here to care for each other.